Um, so when you try and reduce cytokines medically with um, the, the new biological drugs, it takes three to four months to get the cytokines down, and they tend to stop not in the normal range like these did. They tend to go below the normal range, which creates some of the side effects that you see with the biologicals. Um, it takes three or four months. It doesn't take 90 minutes. So these changes in cytokines um, are extraordinary. Interleukin-1, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha dropped from an average of 305 down to 78. Look at the, look at the tight cluster here. The initial patient went down from 300 down to 20, so that's a reduction of 15 times. Interleukin-6 went from 204 down to 15, or the average group went from 239 down to 76. These reductions in inflammatory peptides are just unheard of. What it means is that when we decrease somebody's pain from a 7 to uh, 1, that there's actually objective evidence that we are indeed reducing pain. So substance P is a peptide produced in the spinal cord that um, reflects pain transmission in the cord or is present when pain transmission is happening in the cord. Um, this was measured in blood, but it's produced in the cord and shipped out um, uh, in the circulation. It went down a factor of more than 10 times, from 132 down to 10. Um, the averages went from 180 down to 54. Now, this patient, was, her pain didn't come down that much, actually. She came maybe from a 7 or an 8 down to a 6. But everybody else, look how tightly grouped their substance P is. There's just not a lot of scatter in these readings. Um, and the other thing that happens in this group is they get, they get pretty stoned. Beta endorphins are what the runners produce when you get that runner's high. It gets kind of floaty. Um, you feel pretty good. Um, endorphins went from an 8 up to a 71 as an average in this whole group. Um, and the initial patient it went from 5 to 88. So it increases by more than 10 times. Cortisol goes up, but it's not a stress response. It just follows the endorphins. So when you get stoned um, with the endorphins, when you get floaty, um, your, cortis your cortisol also goes up because ACTH goes up. Um, what this means is when we reduce somebody's pain from a 7.3 to a 1.3, it means it's not placebo effect. It means that the frequencies are having an actual physical effect that is reflected by um, uh, changes in inflammatory peptides and um, substance P. So the pain went from a seven average of 7.3 to 1.3, 90 minutes the first treatment and 40 minutes at every subsequent treatment. All patients had pain relief. And what we found is that 58% of these patients recover in four months. Um, so in my world, the most important thing you need to know about fibromyalgia is that it's curable. Um, the first uses we did, we had for fibromyalgia were for frequency-specific microcurrent were in the treatment of myofascial pain or myofascial trigger points, muscle pain, and um, started treating those still having trouble with audio. It's like, what do you want them to do? What are they supposed to click? It's the quick start. Quick start button in the upper left, apparently. If you're having trouble here, oh, of course you can't hear me, then you can't hear me tell you this. Um, 50 cases published were published in Topics in Clinical Chiropractic in 1998. Um, these were patients that were an average of seven years, of five years chronic. Um, the range was one to 28 years, and it was a collected case report, but the patients roughly served as their own controls because 88% had failed with other treatments. And in this group, it was 11 treatments in eight weeks, and um, their pain went from an average of a 6.8, which is pretty high, seven out of 10, down to a one and a half out of 10. And it took this long, 11 visits in eight weeks, because we didn't know what we were doing. We thought that the 
muscle tightness and muscle pain that we felt was what was actually going on. Um, what it turned out to be in the cervical spine was um, joint inflammation and disc inflammation and um, ligamentous laxity. When we started treating those, the results went down to roughly what we found in the lumbar spine cases, which were eight years chronic, 87% had failed with other treatments, and they had six visits in six weeks. And this is more typical of what we do in myofascial pain. Their pain goes from an average of a seven to an average of a one and a half in um, six visits in six weeks. And this is more typical of what we do with what frequency-specific microcurrent does with patients who have um, chronic low back pain and actually neck pain now that we know what we're doing. So the other thing in medicine that's really, really, really hard to treat medically is neuropathic pain. And oddly enough, with frequency-specific microcurrent, that is the easiest thing we treat. So if you have sciatica, or you have a radiculopathy in your neck, uh, even the thoracic spine, if you have a nerve traction injury or disc bulge in the thoracic spine, frequency-specific microcurrent is really, really, really good at treating nerve pain. It is the easiest thing we treat. This study was done on just 20 patients. It's a published paper in 2010 now. 20 patients, seven years chronic. The chronicity was any place from one week to 44 years. As an average of five, treatments, 4.6 treatments is an average between 1 and 15 treatments. The first treatment, they went from an average of a 6.8 um, down to an average of a 1.8 um, at the end of the first treatment. So you go from a 7 to a 2, roughly, at the first treatment. And when you come back, you've come up from a 2, but you only go back to a 5. When you come to a 5 out of 10 on the 0 to 10 visual analog pain scale, and you leave at slightly less than a one, someplace between a zero and a one. And at the end of six, five treatments, 65% of these patients fully recovered. So that's 13 out of the 20. Part of the challenge that we have in both neuropathic pain and fibromyalgia is um, if you've been in pain for an average of seven years, and if your pain has been around a seven, between a five and a seven for seven years, and somebody takes you to a zero in 90 minutes or 60 minutes, you have to ask, who are you? Frequency-specific microcurrent in both fibromyalgia and in neuropathic pain creates a, an existential crisis that's pretty much unparalleled in medicine. If you've been in pain for 14 years and somebody takes your pain to a zero, in 60 minutes, it's just odd. You just feel odd. So it takes some patients some time to get used to that situation. Um, everybody had their pain go down. There was nobody it didn't work on, but not everybody is able to stay and get the disc recovered or repaired that's causing the nerve pain um, and do the exercises and rehab that it takes to repair the spine that's aggravating the nerve. FSM is used a lot in diabetic peripheral neuropathies. Um, this patient had a seven centimeter ulcer. Can you see how swollen the lower leg is? Um, this picture is a little bit squished, but anyway, at a seven centimeter ulcer on the medial side of his uh, left leg, uh, the second digit on his right foot, you can't see the slides, second digit on his right foot, and the third digit on his left foot um, were both necrotic or black. Um, sensation loss in seven out of 10 areas. So his foot was numb and painful. So his pain was about a six or a seven and his feet were numb and he had these nasty ulcers on his feet. Um, short version is they were all healed in six weeks between six and 11 treatments depending. So at the end of four weeks, eight treatments, the sensation was completely restored in the bottom of his feet, and his pain level was a zero. Um, this nasty necrotic toe was completely healed in about 12 sessions, um, six weeks, twice a week. This was healed in three to four weeks. This was healed in about two to three weeks. 
So diabetic wounds and peripheral neuropathies are very hard to fix medically. Um, and there's just not a lot of good treatment for it. Um, no audio. I, we're going to need to find a different platform. I was done. Um, so that's what we do in diabetic neuropathies. It's pretty exciting, um, especially if you know somebody that has diabetes. It's very concerning, and it's progressive, and FSM is inexpensive to do and easy to apply. And um, if you know anybody that has diabetic neuropathies, you might find a frequency-specific microcurrent practitioner near them to share this with. Delayed onset muscle soreness. This is a controlled trial. Delayed onset muscle soreness is what happens to you if you go out and work in the yard or go to the gym and you work out and you do eccentric um, um, muscle contractions and your muscles get sore the next day. Everybody's done that, I think, when you go out and work out and you get sore the next day. So in this study, it was done by Denise Curtis in Ireland. Um, they had one machine that was turned on treating one leg and the other machine was turned off, um, which gave us a sham treatment. And um, that meant that this was a control trial. The patient didn't know which um, leg was being treated. And um, as you can see, the, the sham leg, the 24 hours after the exercise, the sham leg pain was a five, the treated leg was a one, and the, um, in general, with delayed onset muscle soreness, uh, the, the second and third day are the 24 hours and 48 hours are um, the most painful. They apply the microcurrent treatment immediately after the exercise for just 20 minutes. Okay, so it's a 20 minute treatment right after the exercise. And at 24 hours, the sham leg was a five and the treated leg was a one. Uh, 48 hours, the sham leg was a seven and the treated leg was a one. So by this time, the patients knew exactly which leg was treated and which leg was sham because this one hurt and this one didn't. And at 72 hours, the pain was a four and the treated leg was less than a one. So the important thing about this study was not only do we have a control trial showing that it's working, but it's compared to a paper that was written in 1999 showing that non-specific microcurrent for the same 20 minutes at the same 200 microamps, non-specific microcurrent didn't work. Um, so this is the one paper we have that shows that um, the frequencies make a difference and that this is not being done all by just the microcurrent. The other important thing, if you're an athlete or you know an athlete, there is no other effective treatment for delayed onset muscle soreness, and there is no effective prevention. So if you're an athlete or a weightlifter um, or even a weekend warrior, there's no effective way to prevent getting sore after you work out except for frequency-specific microcurrent. We have the delayed onset muscle soreness um, protocol that you can load on a home unit that a practitioner can prescribe and you can take home and use on yourself. So it's, FSM has a lot of uses and it's pretty much a game changer. There is no way to treat DOMS and obviously for us, it's easy. Uh, this p-value, it's a statistical measure with three zeros. So basically there's no chance that this was um, coincidence. This kind of statistic says that the treatment is what caused the result. So that was a pretty exciting paper for us in 2010. This is a case report on singles. There's one frequency combination. The only thing it's good for is singles, uh, oral and genital herpes, and singles in the active state. So it's not good for um, post herpetic neuralgia. And this is. Um, the singles in the ophthalmic branch of five. So this rash is on this 85-year-old man. It's on the top of his head, goes just back behind his ear, down just under his eye. And these are open lesions on his, on his scalp. He was bald, um, which makes him easier to see. Um, um, we treated him for one hour. 
uh, in the about noon, got the pain down, and then he came back for treatment that night, two hours that night, and the next night he came back and we treated him again because <clears throat> he was having some trouble with the vision in his right eye. And uh, he was pain-free after that first hour. He had no return of pain. In a total of basically five hours, not four hours of treatment, it was five hours, um, the, shing the blisters were drying up by the second day, and they were completely gone at about three to four days. And the thing that makes this case publishable, so it was published in um, Practical Pain Management in 2010, the non-pharmacologic treatment of, of singles, um, the reason it was publishable is that singles in the ophthalmic branch of the fifth cranial nerve, so this one that's on the top of the head and across the eye, and an 85-year-old man does not get better. Um, it is almost always um, results in post neuralgia in patients of this age, and it is extremely painful, can cause loss of vision in the eye. And to have it gone in five hours of treatment uh, with no residual pain and have the lesions dry up in 24 hours, that is extraordinary. And it is so outside the realm of what is known in the natural course of singles that um, practical pain management published it as a, a peer-reviewed paper. So um, that's frequency-specific. Plain microcurrent will not do that. So there are frequencies that dissolve scar tissue in mature burns. Uh, I did this study at um, Mercy St. John's Hospital in Springfield, Missouri, in the burn unit. Um, we had eight patients. And we studied them, uh, the PTs measured them um, on Monday, the range of motion on Monday, measured the range of motion on Friday, and I treated them an hour a day, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, three days in a row. And every patient has statistically significant permanent increases in range of motion after three one-hour treatments. And this is the treatment team um, at uh, Mercy St. John's that worked with Dr. Huckfeld, um, Huckfeld's department. This was done in 2003. These patients all had chronic burn scars, which are considered to be the most difficult to treat. So to have this kind of result in this kind of patient that was documented by physical therapists measuring them uh, was pretty much blinded. They didn't know who was being treated. Um, and um, that was an exciting week. So um, this suggests that plain scar tissue, now I can't make your skin look normal. They still look like they had scars, but the scars were more mobile. The scar tissue was more flexible. Their range of motion increased significantly. Okay. There are frequencies that FSM uses to treat the brain. The nervous system is very responsive to frequencies. It is an information processing system, and FSM is frequency-specific information. So this study was done by Alicia Thomas. Um, her credentials are down here. She's a PhD in education. She practices in Florida. This was a patient with a traumatic brain injury. Um, had a auto, uh, was an auto accident versus motorcycle. He was on the motorcycle. Um, so that didn't go so well with him. Um, this was his pre-treatment. The blue line is the pre-treatment EEG. So this is all um, documented. This is the blue line. And then she did one treatment, and this is post-treatment at week one, or the red lines. So language and memory improved, sleep improved, his anxiety level came down. That was pretty exciting for him. And um, it's just this is the best documented case. It has not been published. But Dr. Thomas presented this at our symposium in 2013. And then language and memory, this area was the prefrontal cortex. We changed to the, she changed to the frequency 
for that area of the brain, and this is post-treatment at week two. Um, she was doing other things for cognitive recovery than um, are shown here. Um, so all of these changes were not created with just FSM. He was doing other things besides, but it's still a profound change, and it's much more dramatic than would have been seen without FSM. So we have data that says we can change the brain. Um, second week, EEG changes in traumatic brain injuries. This study was done by Roger Billica in um, Fort Collins, Colorado. He measured this patient with heart rate variability um, um, measuring devices. And the patient um, after lunch uh, came in and his parasympathetics were a little bit above his sympathetics, so that graph isn't here. Um, but then he ran the frequency to increase the sympathetics and quiet the parasympathetics. So what, 60 seconds on that frequency, 60 seconds on the frequency to quiet the parasympathetics, and just drove the parasympathetics down into the ground. And they started out three, four minutes before above the activity of the sympathetics. Run the frequencies and the sympathetics um, and parasympathetics change dramatically. Um, then, so you run the frequencies for a minute apiece and then do a two minute rest. So the frequencies have washed out. Um, frequencies washed out, and then uh, parasympathetics, uh, then they retested it. Then he ran the frequencies to quiet the sympathetics and increase the parasympathetics one minute each. So this is one minute for quieting the sympathetics, one minute increasing the parasympathetics, a two minute rest, and this is what happened to the data. So the heart rate variability changed a lot. And um, uh, this is what happens. So you can quiet sympathetic tone, so relieve anxiety. You can increase parasympathetic activity and improve digestion. Pretty much it will. So the frequencies are incredibly powerful when it comes to working with the nervous system in both brain injuries, in autism as well, and in autonomic, the autonomic nervous system. Um, one of the big challenges in medicine is. Do you want to take questions as we go, or do you want to? Uh, if it's about what? Uh, diabetes. Oh, let's we'll go back to it. Um, one of the big challenges in medicine is inflammation. So every degenerative disease, everyone, is associated with either lipoxygenase, LOX, L-O-X, lipoxygenase-mediated inflammation, or cyclooxygenase-mediated inflammation. And we have a blinded animal study, like the animals weren't blind, but the people who were treating the animals, measuring the animals, were blinded as to whether the animals had been treated or not, or painted. So all the researchers were blinded and the animals were, you know, regular, uh, uh, mice that could see. Um, so there was, they paint arachidonic acid on the mouse's ears, and this is how much it should swell. When you run the frequency to reduce inflammation in the immune system, um, lipoxygenase-mediated inflammation went down by 62% in minutes in every animal tested, and it's time-dependent. So half the response was there at two minutes, and the full response is there at four minutes. COX mediated went down by 30% in four minutes in every animal tested. It doesn't sound so good, but that's equivalent to injectable toradol when it was um, studied in the same animal model. And the researcher running the lab didn't believe it. That would be Vivian Reeve. And so she put in a placebo frequency, and uh, it was still 62% uh, and not equivalent. I mean, the Placebo had no effect. So that was, that's extraordinary. It means that FSM is going to be useful in virtually every degenerative disease. 
and they wanted to see would any other frequency reduce inflammation. So they did, would just the microcurrent by itself, just one-tenth of a hertz, produce any reduction in swelling. So you paint arachidonic acid on the mouse's ears, and then you run one-tenth of a hertz. And mm, no, didn't do anything. Then they ran um, four minutes of two other frequency combinations, and there was no reduction in swelling. Um, they think nine hertz might have had created this little bit of a change, but it's not statistically significant. So not only does the frequency 40 hertz and 116 create dramatic reductions in inflammation, no other frequency reduced inflammation at all. So at this point, after you've just seen all the nifty things that frequency-specific microcurrent does, you got to ask, how is that working? How does it, how does it do that? Well, the fact of the matter is that cells are semiconductors, kind of like the computer chip in your computer, except the semiconductors in your body use water molecules flickering back and forth to create the space for the electron that makes it a semiconductor. Um, your computer uses silicon and germanium. Your body uses water. So your body is biochemical and bioelectric. So there is a gel lattice that fills the inside of every cell. Um, and water molecules line that gel matrix and flicker in such a way as to form structures that turn membranes into semiconductors. Semiconductors create an instantaneous flow of current and information when you modulate the current and the place where the electrons are, you can convey information to the cells and your body. So it's very much like a computer chip, okay? So your body conducts current and information um, lots of books on this going back to Becker, The Body Electric, James Osman, uh, Energy Medicine, The Scientific Basis. Um, and the mechanism by which the frequencies have this effect is biological resonance. What is up with no sound? Do we need a big button that says, to get sound, push this button? I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> so <laughs> living the sound is working, everyone. I yeah. don't know why some, some people, people can't hear it. Being able to connect. Living matter. So biologic resonance is how the frequencies produce these effects. Living matter responds to coherent signals. So you are you are surrounded by frequencies all the time. Cell phones. Your um, wall current, 60 cycle wall current is 60 hertz, okay? But it's white noise. There's no, like the light bulb has a frequency that it puts out, but it's not coherent. It's white noise, it's fuzzy. Um, when you put a coherent signal into biological tissue, the tissue responds. Um, kind of like when a singer sings that note that shatters a lead crystal glass. It's because the note resonates with the frequency that holds lead atoms together in that lead crystal glass. Drugs and nutrients act like keys in a lock that change membrane protein um, configuration and thereby change cell function. We're used to drugs, pharmaceuticals, herbs, and nutritional substances acting like a can of lock. That's a, that's a model that we're used to, to change cell function. The frequencies act like your key fob, your beeper, that opens that same lock, opens the door with an electromagnetic signal. So it's the same lock, it's the same cell membrane receptor, but, um, the pharmaceuticals change it like a key in a lock. Supplements change it like a key in a lock. The frequencies change it the way your key fob 
opens a door lock, okay, with a signal. So this receptor, if you can get it to change, it changes internal um, substances inside the cell called kinases, that changes transcription vectors, that modifies gene expression, and that changes what the cell does, like create or secrete inflammatory cytokines. So all those cytokines that you saw changing on those graphs, they were created by changes in cell signaling, okay? Interleukin-1, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, interferon gamma, and CGRP were all, all created by genetic expression, by the cell producing these pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, in point of fact, drugs take a long time to change the receptors and change and change these cytokines. Um, after what has been, it's been 18 years since we have this data, we've come to the conclusion that only changes in cell signaling could normalize these cytokines so quickly because otherwise they change very slowly. So here's the question, where do the frequencies come from? That's everybody wants to know. And the answer is, we don't know. They were developed in the early 1900s, mostly by MDs and DOs, used extensively between about 1908, um, 1910, the Flexner Report came out. 1917, the AMA got a little bit serious about it. 1934, um, they decreed that drugs and surgery was the way that medicine was going to go. And anybody that used electromagnetic therapies, herbs, homeopathy, or nutritional substances would lose their license to practice, which back then was granted by the AMA. So I got, in 1995, I got a list of frequencies from an osteopath who bought a practice in 1946 that came with a machine that was built in 1922. That machine came with a list of frequencies. All of the people who developed those frequencies, that shared them in medical journals, the Electromedical Digest, the Pathometric Society, all of that was lost when that generation of physicians died out in the 1940s. What we do know is that the clinical response is very specific. So I got a list. And on this list, let's say 40 hertz was the frequency to reduce inflammation. So I started using it as if 40 hertz was the frequency to reduce inflammation, and it turned out to do exactly that. 13 hertz is the frequency to dissolve scar tissue. And it turns out that that is the only thing that 13 hertz is good for. The whole list has been verified, pretty much the whole list has been verified clinically in the last um, 20 years. Well, 23 years now, I started using the list in 1995, uh, so 23 years ago. Um, at this point, we're uncertain how they were derived. I have no idea how somebody in 1922 decided that 191 hertz was the frequency for the tendon and 62 hertz was the frequency for the artery and 116 hertz was the frequency for the immune system. I have no idea. but. Our, my role and the frequency-specific microcurrent community, our role has been to test them and to see if they work. Um, and in point of fact, the clinical response is very specific and it matches the list. So we're really uncertain of the mechanisms of action, but this model that says that the um, cell signaling and changes in genetic expression are how the frequencies work that model is um, testable at this point. No, I just have to be in the right place at the right time with the right patient with a company that can do the testing that we need to verify it. I can tell you that the 1920s equipment was not microcurrent. Microcurrent is physical therapy equipment. It was introduced in 1979 in the US. It delivers current in millions of an ampere uh, it's about a thousand times less than tens. It is physiologic, it's subsensory. You can't feel it. It's the same kind of current your body produces on its own. Um, they're battery operated. They don't plug into the wall, so it's quite safe. It's a low risk device. 
and they are approved by the FDA as if they were TENS devices, even though they are a thousand times less current than TENS. If you're a clinician um, that is going to be billing for it, if you're a patient that's going to be treated with it, it is billed as if it is attended e-STEM, electrical STEM. Um, but if you're a physical therapist or an osteopath or a chiropractor using it, um, in conjunction with manual therapy or proprioceptive neural facilitation, that's what PNF stands for, um, you can go for it. So it is approved, it's billable. Um, the FDA does not have a, an opinion or a position on the use of frequencies uh, as therapeutic options. And since FSM doesn't make any claims about them, we just report data um, that is produced, and that's fine with the FDA. Um, so the devices are billable, and um, the frequencies appear to be quite reproducible. The devices increase ATP production. Um, uh, in, this was done in rat skin in 1982, Nakcheng. 10 to 500 micrograms increased ATP production by 500%. That increased protein synthesis by 70%, increased amino acid transport by 40%. And in Seeger's, she reproduced Noctang's work in 2001 and 2002, and she um, determined that it does activate signal transduction, which is what modifies that genetic expression. So we know that the current by itself has these effects, and then we add on top of that the effect of the frequencies. So the frequencies are very good at increasing healing. Some of you know, um, Tara Lawns back in 2004, it's such a long time ago now. Um, on a Sunday, he tore his deltoid and interosseous ligaments. Those are the ligaments that hold the two lower leg bones together, and the fibula and the tibia hold those together. So those two bones were just basically ripped apart. The deltoid ligament on the outside of the ankle was torn off and he had a fracture in his fibula, the little, the little bone in your leg. And um, they called me on the 20th and said he wanted to play in the Super Bowl in six weeks. So I flew to Philadelphia on Monday night, treated him on Tuesday morning. As soon as he got out of surgery, I treated him for 12 out, 24 hours, treated him from the time he got in the car at eight o'clock in the morning until about 10 o'clock the next morning, treating him overnight, um, sleeping on the couch. And um, the next day, so Tuesday, his leg, ankle should have been the size of a football and black and purple. And um, in point of fact, there was no bruising, no swelling. Um, I, he was treated five days a week for six weeks. Um, the surgeon was running around telling everybody in the country that it was 18 weeks um, to heal that injury, and it probably he would probably never play again. And in six weeks, he played in the Super Bowl and ran for 157 yards, I think. And he had no pain meds, no pain, didn't break the pins. Um, so the combination of the frequencies that stop bleeding and the current that increases energy production in the cells and the ability to treat the tissue for being torn and broken and removing the fact of trauma and reducing inflammation in wounds um, and injuries. This is an example of what we're able to do. This is an acute burn. He got uh, splashed with um, boiling oil. He was deep frying some food and the uh, oil spat up when he put something wet in there. So he had active blisters, so this is second degree burn. Um, and basically, 11 days later, and he only had four treatments, they put microcurrent sticky pads um, over the burn, and um, he was treated by his GP at home. He didn't go to a burn unit. And in 11 days, this is what he looked like. So that to that in a week and a half. Um, that's what microcurrent and FSM are able to do in wound healing. Um, more day-to-day. -day. Um, this is skin anti-aging. 
Um, this patient was treating with the anti-aging protocol three times a week for two weeks, twice a week for two weeks, and then once a month for maintenance. But this is after the first month. And if you notice the, late, the lines in her lips and the labial folds are flatter, the lines in her lips are thinner, the jowls are a little bit less. She was pretty enough to start with um, prior to treatment. And afterwards, it was even better. This is the application. You just put um, contact behind your neck and a contact in a warm, warm, wet tunnel over your face, deliver the current, and this is what happens. The current by itself will cause a 39% increase in blood flow in 20 days of treatment. This was in rabbits at University of Washington. Um, a 14% increase in collagen, um, which let you know how it is that this tissue can uh, look so much better. And then there's a 48% increase in elastin, which means the tissue is more flexible. So something simple like skin anti-aging, which everybody likes, um, is profoundly effective. And that, that was the only thing you did with it. You'd be just fine. You don't have to treat nerve pain or muscle pain or disc injuries or brain injuries or burns. You can just do skin anti-aging and have everybody be pretty happy. Um, if you want to know about FSM, uh, the text frequency-specific microcurrent and pain management textbook was published by Elsevier in 2010. And this year, the resonance effect was published by North Atlantic Books. This is a can't-put-it-down page turner of a book. Fascinating, funny, inspired, exciting, and altogether delightful. I'm just ecstatic that Jim Osman and um, everybody else has read it, is very happy with the resonance effect. Um, you can get it on Amazon. The reviews on Amazon are pretty good. Learn how FSM started and what it does and how it works. And it describes the journey of how these frequencies were um, used and what our experience is with them in all sorts of conditions. And the resonance effect contains frequencies for different conditions like asthma and irritable bowel and um, emotional frequencies. Those are actually in the book. Um, so if you have a microcurrent device, I only publish the ones that were safe for you to treat yourself with. Um, and it will just give you an idea of what we're able to do. If you want to learn about FSM, send your practitioner or be a practitioner that comes to the course. The course is now four days and it's four full days. Um, it is a cardinal core seminar. We do have um, an advanced seminar, but this is the, the prerequisite. Four-day core seminar. There's two and a half days of physical medicine. Um, includes differential diagnosis. So to treat with FSM, if you want to treat leg pain, um, you have to figure out what's causing the leg pain. So leg pain can come from nerves, muscles, joints, um, and you have to treat the right thing with the right thing. So this is a pretty comprehensive training. Um, it is open to physical therapists, medical physicians, MDs, DCs, chiropractors, um, osteopathic physicians, physical therapists, occupational therapists, acupuncturists, naturopaths, nurses, nurse practitioners, um, and trainers um, who would be interested in using it in injury recovery and sports medicine. It is a lecture, and there are eight hands-on practicum sessions. Lots of individual attention. And you pretty much by Sunday night, you're competent. You're safe. Um, but there's a three-month three learning curve. It's like learning a language in four days. So it takes some time to get good at it. Um, the equipment is inexpensive as equipment goes any place between $2,200 and $6,500 for equipment um, to suit pretty much any need. The frequencies are taught separately from the devices, so you get to choose whatever kind of equipment you want to use. And the fact of the matter is that everything changes when you can reduce inflammation, treat nerve pain, treat muscle pain, dissolve scar tissue, increase ATP. Everything changes when you use frequency-specific microcurrent. Medicine can be more effective, more efficient um, when you use frequency-specific microcurrent. 
If you want to download the published papers and look at our frequently asked questions, go to www.frequencyspecific.com. And um, the devices are at www.precisiondistributing.com, although there are other devices out there in the world. Um, but these are the ones that we use and we use during the practicums. So FSM is a new paradigm that creates new possibilities for medicine. Nerve pain is untreatable, and for FSM, it's easy. Medicine can be more efficient, more effective, and less expensive when you add FSM. Thanks for joining us, and we'll talk to you next month. Oh, we have questions. Okay. Uh, does FSM work with neuropathy of the feet when it's not related to diabetes? Does FSM work with neuropathy of the feet when it's not related to diabetes? Yes. Um, there are protocols for chemotherapy neuropathies. There are some kinds of neuropathies that are created because you are B12 deficient. So you don't have enough um, methylated B12 and your feet get numb. So if you are a 68-year-old vegan and you've been a vegetarian for the last 18 years and you've been a vegan for the last five, unless, yeah, that that kind of neuropathy is caused by B12 deficiency or because you can't methylate B12 and turn it into the active form. And FSM doesn't work for that. Basically for that, you have to have methylated B12. So um, it, there are different kinds of neuropathies. It works for then Christian neuropathies, but not cisplatin neuropathies. So the platinum chemotherapy agents are a little bit of a problem. The vincristin neuropathies do pretty well. Uh, and then what about treating arthritis? Arthritis is basically inflammation, right? So the mouse research um, that showed that we can reduce Lox and Cox inflammation, arthritis is basically inflammatory. So I can get the inflammation down. You have to ask um, why you have all that joint inflammation. So sometimes we'll put people on essential fatty acids take them off of gluten, corn, milk, and soy, the foods they're allergic to that tend to create inflammation. And, um, um, but yeah, it works really well for joint pain. Uh, to keep the pain down, you have to do other things, but to get the pain down is usually pretty straightforward. And then somebody asked, do I prefer towels or pads? And I tend to use um, the wraps with Alligator clips, um, uh, wet towels when I'm treating people for neuropathic pain. Sticky pads are okay. Like when I broke my shoulder, I treated the fracture with sticky pads because I didn't want to be in bed with wet something on me for 12 hours a day. Um, so it, it just depends on the circumstance, what you're treating, where, what kind of coverage you're, you need. So if you need something that goes all the way around the neck and all the way around the feet, there's no way to do that with sticky pads. So that's when we use the wet towels versus the pads. So it's, in general, I like the towels because I can increase the current and um, uh, without causing any prickling, and the sticky pads tend to get prickly when you increase the current. Did you talk about uh, diverticulitis already? Diverticulitis, uh, it's inflammatory. Um, there are pouches in the colon. The standard medical treatment for that is um, antibiotics or dogmentin. And in the acute phase, we recommend that you do the antibiotics. We don't want to replace standard medical therapy. We just want to augment it. So you do the antibiotics for the five to 10 days that they give them to you, but then you still have the diverticulite of little pouches. And you want to keep the inflammation down in those and you, you want to increase uh, the connective tissue that, that can make that pouch um, stronger and keep it from breaking through. You need to take enough magnesium that your bowels keep moving and you don't uh, put excess pressure on the colon um, to, maintain, to maintain the stable state, to maintain what you do. That takes some diet and lifestyle and maybe even some supplement changes, but the FSM makes all of that work much better because you can increase ATP production, reduce inflammation, and um, and repair connective tissue. We good? Yeah. Okay. We'll see you next month. Whoops. If there is.
Is there anything that FSM does not or cannot assist in treatment? Is there anything you can't assist with? I can't put tissue back that's not there. So if you have a torn ACL, it's a torn ACL. Um, infection, we can, we can reduce the pain in infection, but when it comes to infection, I believe in chemical warfare. There's a reason that God invented antibiotics. So I prefer that the practitioners not treat infection with um, FSM. Um, can't put tissue back that's not there, and we don't treat cancer. You can treat radiation burns. You can treat the nausea from chemotherapy. You can help with post-op recovery. With terminal patients, you can help keep the pain down, but we don't treat cancer. So um, that's that kind of that's the limitations. Uh, I got people asking about gout and contralateral treatment. Yeah, gout's easy. That's just wicked. That's just so fun. I love treating gout. It's just it's crazy. So it goes from red and sore and swollen and nasty, and about 45 minutes later, it's pain free. Most of the time, sometimes it takes two or three treatments. Then you still have to be careful with your diet and you still have to treat the liver because the reason you have gout is your liver can't process what you're eating, the periods and preeminence that you're eating. So, um, yep, gout's easy. And I don't understand contralateral treatment. So, basically, whatever's busted is what you treat. Um, that's, that's how that works. So um, I have treated patients with, let's say, RSD that can't, can't be touched on the right side. You can treat the spinal cord with the contact going from the neck to the left foot um, to get the spinal cord sensitization down. Um, but I'm not sure what you mean by contralateral treatment. Uh, yeah, I'll go in. Yeah, I can answer this. Okay. Okay. I'll probably use these slides again next month. It was kind of fun. I will see you next month and have a great week.